distinguished delegates, collaborating taxonomists, partner organizations, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the Global Taxonomy Initiative Forum for 2020. Taxonomy and systematics are crucial areas for advancement in biological science. In recent years, new technologies applied to taxonomic research have opened the doors for parties to observe previously unknown organisms, both those are beneficial and those that may be harmful to human societies. Today, we are meeting online as the result of the novel coronavirus pandemic, a crisis that also teaches us that early detection and rapid response to new pathogens using new technologies and robust bioinformatics are necessary to build a better and safer future. It is clear to the global community that we need more experts in this critical domain to build our knowledge for bio of biodiversity and our understanding of the impacts of human activities on ecosystems that threaten human life and social and economic develop development. I would like to express my gratitude, sincere gratitude to the government of Germany and to the Museum of Natural, Hi Natural History in Berlin for organizing and co-hosting this year's Global Taxonomy Initiative Forum in this critical time. I also thank the government of Japan through the Japan uh, Biodiversity Fund for supporting important capacity building activities in taxonomy over the past decade. My sincere appreciation extends to you many experts, institutions, and partners that have contributed to the Global Taxonomy Initiative and engage numerous young taxonomists, citizen scientists, civil society organizations, and industries in the implementation of the convention. This is critical time indeed. The recently published fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook noted that Aichi Biodiversity Target 12 on reducing risks of extinction was not met. Nearly one quarter of the species threatened with extinction, unless the drivers of biodiversity loss are drastically reduced. According to the 2019 IPBS Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystems, around one million plant and animal species are threatened with extinction, many within, these de within decades and more than ever before in human history. Many species are disappearing faster than we can document and record their existence, unfortunately. The IPBS report also alerts us to the reality that slowing species loss by 2030 and beyond may only be achieved through transformative change across economic, social, political, and technological sectors. We are in the process to develop a global framework to realize such transformative change. The draft post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework proposes to put forward renewed and enhanced enabling activities for parties to put ambitious targets for species conservation and to ensure the integrity of natural ecosystems. In this context, taxonomy and its related technologies are important for parties to advance biodiversity management in the next decade. The, te the tools, technologies, and knowledge have uh, made available to you as scientists in this forum need to be in the hands of people protecting and valuing biodiversity and must be applied effectively on the ground. To do so, actions such as upscaling of training of species identification, facilitation of access to biological specimens and data, and collaborative research 
on biodiversity should be continued and further enhanced. The good news is that Global Biodiversity Outlook 5th edition also showed good progress on target 19, which is on knowledge sharing, transfer and transfer and use. There has been a substantial increase in data and information on biodiversity available to citizens, researchers and policymakers. By advancing capacity development and taking scientifically sound actions, we can move toward the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. This is an urgent time for biodiversity, as the evidence clearly shows that the pressures of human activities are threatening the resilience of the very ecosystem services that we depend on. It is time to promote and support the research and use the knowledge on biodiversity accumulated in taxonomic institutions and enhance capacity development, drawing on the excellent work of dedicated taxonomists and developers of new technologies and innovations. I have no doubt that our shared curiosities for nature and discovery will continue to grow and that the Global Taxonomy Initiative will continue to play its important role in support to develop and implement the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. I wish you all a productive forum and look forward to learning of your outcomes, which will be shared with our subsidiary body on implementation at its next third meeting early next year. I thank you for your support to the work of the convention and please we call upon you, we depend on you to further the work of the convention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Very encouraging message. And uh, well, as a part of the secretariat, I myself join your message deeply. And uh, um, now uh, we will invite Mr. Ralph Be Be Becker, uh, the deputy head of division International Cooperation on Biodiversity of Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature and Nuclear Safety of Germany. Um, the Germany is co-hosting the GDI forum to deliver uh, uh, the uh, outcomes. So, um, Mr. Becker, uh, the floor is now for you. Thank you very much, Junko. Dear Executive Secretary Mirima, thank you for your inspiring remarks. Dear Mr. Toshio Tori, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon from Berlin. It is my great pleasure to virtually welcome you to the Global Taxonomy Initiative Forum on behalf of the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety. It is encouraging that the forum takes place in this virtual format despite the challenges we all face currently globally. I would like to thank the Museum for Naturkunde and the Secretariat for their preparatory and organizational work to make the forum happen. The forum will discuss activities to support the development and implementation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. This is an important task because the COVID-19 pandemic reminds us in a drastic way that the loss of biological diversity is increasingly becoming a risk to our survival and to global security. The new post-2020 framework must therefore be ambitious. It must include strong implementation mechanisms to ensure that we respond adequately and in a timely manner to the drivers of biodiversity loss. The framework must also provide an answer to the COVID-19 pandemic and contain the necessary actions that are required to protect global bio biological diversity and reduce the risk of zoonosis. Ladies and gentlemen, conserving, restoring and sustainably using biological diversity depends on our ability to identify organisms 
and to name and refer to individual species and other groups in order to exchange and share information and knowledge about them and about biodiversity in general. Without a taxonomic knowledge base, tackling the biodiversity crisis and achieving and implementing the goals of the convention would be very difficult, if not impossible. It is important to generate support for building capacities and relevant scientific infrastructures for taxonomy, especially in biodiversity rich regions and countries where these are most needed. Therefore, Germany has been a long time supporter and active participant of the Global Taxonomy Initiative. This is to our national focal point for the GTI, which has been with the Berlin Natural History Museum since 2009. This is also through various international activities focusing on training and capacity building for taxonomic needs. These range from academic exchanges and joint research programs to training of staff and experts on the ground, such as via our International Climate Initiative. Germany also welcomes and actively supports several key stakeholder organizations and initiatives which are active for the Global Taxonomy Initiative at international level, and which we are very happy to see being represented at this meeting. We are privileged to be able to co-host this forum. We hope that you will be able to provide important support for developing and implementing the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. I wish you very interesting exchanges and a very successful GTI forum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Birke. Uh, for the very warm and welcome and uh, very, um, you know, strong commitment that you have expressed uh, from the European country. Um, we are now uh, have a video message from the government of Japan. Uh, Mr. Toshio Torii, the Director General of the Nature Conservation Bureau of the Ministry of the Environment, Japan. The video will start. I would like to begin by thanking the Secretariat of the CBD and the government of Germany for organizing the Global Taxonomy Initiative Forum 2020. Especially, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to Dr. Junko Shimura, a program management officer, for her great efforts on organizing this online forum, regardless of technical difficulties. Japan is pleased that uh, progress was made in removing the taxonomic impediment in developing countries with Japan biodiversity plan. Uh, evidence on the status of biodiversity is critical to produce sound uh, strategies from implementing the uh, management of biodiversity. With advanced technologies and shared information, the taxonomy in the 21st century is changing the way of monitoring biodiversity. Yet the museum specimens and education on biodiversity is a critically important foundation to the society. For example, regulatory actions and enhanced roles of civil society, citizens, scientists, youth and women, business in conservation. Since 2010, as a contribution to the capacity building in taxonomy in East and Southeast Asia region. Japan has offered a series of training courses for young government officers and researchers through the framework of ESG, East and Southeast Asia Biodiversity Information Initiative. Trainees of those training courses are now trainers in their uh, respective countries and are widely spreading out their knowledge and skill. In the end, I expect the uh, taxonomy advances with broad sectors to fully implement the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Tri, and uh, um, I thank uh, both government of Germany and uh, government of Japan for the long period of uh, um, support to advance the Global Taxonomy Initiative, as well as uh, all partners and uh, uh, dedicated taxonomists. Now we would like to move to the next agenda item. Um, we have to uh, move to organizational matters uh, to uh, select uh, co-chairs for this forum. Um, Secretariat has approached to a few of um, um, selected participants approved by SUBS Bureau uh, back in February. They are party representatives and um, um, oh, it is very important to inform you that uh, we received more than 200 registrants uh, to watch uh, this what global taxonomy initiative. We don't distinguish um, the observers, those observers and selected participants approved by Bureau during the forum. But uh, for the formality, um, we would like to have co-chairs, preferably from the selected participants uh, as a regional representatives. So we have approached the uh, um, the co-hosting institute, uh, Natural History Museum in Berlin, and uh, Dr. Christoph Häuser uh, kindly accepted to take uh, the role. Um, another uh, co-chair, uh, we expected to have someone from uh, developing countries, and um, um, unfortunately, that person uh, fell in sick at the very last moment, and currently he is under doctor stop. Um, therefore, um, the Secretariat sincerely asked the regional representatives uh, whether you are able to offer um, your time to take the co-chair's role. Um, if anybody is interested in, Preferably from developing countries, could you possibly unmute your microphone? I don't see anybody uh, at the moment. Um, okay, so then there will be another possibility whether the forum uh, formal participants wish to have a single chair instead of co-chairs um, that that will be another option and so if anybody who wishes to speak please unmute the microphone i don't see any so okay so congratulations uh dr Heuser. Um, you are elected as a chair uh, for the next three days, and um, the may I possibly hand over the role uh, to facilitate this session to adopt the agenda. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Junko, and uh, again, um, a good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to to everybody. Um, <laughs> It's my um, duty and my, uh, hopefully also a little bit my pleasure, but certainly a big honor to be your, uh, yeah, as I said, single co-chair uh, for this meeting. And as you have heard, um, our first uh, duty, and this goes especially to the designated um, uh, delegates um, for this meeting is uh, to adopt the provisional agenda. Let me also for everybody um, just point out that uh, initially, this uh, GTI forum was planned to take place uh, physically um, in um, February, March uh, this year. And of course, uh, with the course of events and the pandemic uh, raging um, over the, across the planet, this had to be uh, initially, um, well, first um, canceled or postponed. And um, this is the reason why we now have to meet uh, virtually. Um, 
Nevertheless, um, we can rely on build on the preparatory work um, done earlier this year. That means um, we have um, the nominated um, participants um, from parties and stakeholders as the official representatives to this forum and additional invited observers and experts and of course all the registered participants also um, are very welcome um, um, to this meeting. Um, as the agenda is structured and you have heard and uh, hopefully seen, we have um, three days ahead of us. The first day today uh, is essentially um, a warming up and uh, a, a setting the scene from the science side. So it's been organized as an open symposium on best practices and challenges of the Global Taxonomy Initiative in um, achieving uh, the original IG targets and uh, also looking out uh, for the possible contribution from the science side to having a, a GTI equivalent contribution for the post-2020 again agenda. As you have heard um, very well from the executive secretary and also the two um, representatives from the supporting um, countries or parties, um, taxonomy or taxonomic capacity and knowledge is and will remain very basic uh, and underlying many of the, uh, the functions um, of the convention. And um, we are therefore uh, grateful um, to all the support and your contributions um, to make that happen. And again, today um, we hope to set the scenes through um, invited lectures and a panel discussion. And then for the remaining two days, it will be work um, uh, by uh, the, the, the group, but also involving contributions or offering contributions um, from the floor uh, to provide input as stated um, to the ongoing process of framing uh, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework for the convention from the aspect um, of the GTI. In other words, to ensure that uh, at least a mandate for building, creating and sustaining the capacity, the taxonomic expertise, the infrastructure to provide these services, especially where they are needed most, is, is kept and ideally um, also lived and, and fulfilled. Um, with this um, general explanation on the agenda and on the outline and the background of the meeting, uh, let me ask you, um, and again this goes especially to the um, invited uh, participants um, and the official representatives, um, if the agenda as, um, as um, uh, in front of you uh, is, um, can be accepted and um, in, if we can adopt them as, as um, on the screen and uh, sent to you. I believe and uh, I will uh, rely on the Secretariat that uh, we still need some or we will receive some technical uh, advice on how to structure or how to um, enable discussion and contributions from you, uh, but we'll do that after we have adopted the agenda. As far as I can see, but um, again, <clears throat> I believe I can move ahead and declare the agenda, the provisional agenda as presented as adopted. Thank you. Um, as said, uh, and as indicated, I believe we would all now benefit uh, from a little bit more of um, technical advice on how to use this GoToWebinar um, um, uh, tool uh, to, practically organize and conduct our meeting. And uh, for that, I would like to hand back to the Secretariat again. Yeah, meanwhile, let me um, continue. And first, as you have heard, um, I would like to convey you uh, the very best um, wishes uh, from um, our colleague, um, Professor Gonzalo Andrade, from the National University of Colombia in Bogota, um, who is uh, one of the nominated experts um, for the GTI forum and who had, at least as I understood, um, kindly accepted to be nominated also as a co-chair um, for this meeting. Um, 
as you heard before, um, Gonzalo had to be uh, taken or was hospitalized actually yesterday. But the good news is, at least as he communicated, uh, both the, um, the COVID test and uh, other examinations were negative. So he believes um, uh, or it looks that he will be back uh, soon. But still, um, he is not available to take part um, in this meeting. and he conveys again best wishes to all of you uh, and of course his, his um, apologies. Um, this will also affect um, our um, agenda for today because um, Professor Andrade was actually scheduled as one of the keynote speakers uh, for this symposium. Um, so uh, in that sense we are short of one uh, speaker uh, for this, this, this meeting today. Uh, which of course uh, allows or relaxes a little bit the otherwise um, uh, tight um, time schedule. So let me, um, for those of you who haven't had time to look in the annotated agenda, uh, just explain once more what um, uh, today's uh, proceeding would look like. And we had uh, again expected uh, three um, keynotes, um, which now will be two from eminent um, scientists um, who have taken part um, in different uh, backgrounds and with different methodologies in um, making the GTI happen on the ground. And um, after these uh, presentations, of course, there will be possibility to discuss with um, those participants and not only asking questions, but we would have, uh, we propose uh, to have following a short break um, for 20 minutes for the rest of the day to have a panel discussion with the speakers and um, one or two other invited um, experts. This again would essentially constitute um, the, the agenda for today. And as said before, hopefully would set the scene uh, from the, uh, the expert background uh, of science and taxonomy, what GTI uh, has been and especially could or should do uh, in the future. Today's um, agenda, which again is, is in formal terms, agenda item three, and um, is to start with our symposium. And um, our first um, uh, speaker today, um, uh, I'm happy to, to announce, uh, will be Professor Paul Ebear from uh, University of Guelph in, in Canada, in Ontario, in Canada. And Paul Ebear, um, I trust, is, is, is very well known uh, to all of you, certainly to all active uh, biologists and taxonomist. Um, he is uh, not only the founder and director of the Center for Biodiversity Genomics at um, Guelph University, but essentially um, one can say he is Mr. DNA barcoding. He has brought DNA barcoding or DNA sequencing techniques to a new horizon and um, uh, he will, uh, I understand, talk to us to a new vision of um, upscaling uh, these techniques um, in, uh, with the uh, idea of um, a bioscan um, project. I believe we have um, uh, also due to logistic constraints, um, his contribution uh, as a uh, online video. And I would like to ask the secretariat now so to speak, to give uh, Paul virtually the floor and uh, start uh, the video talk. Uh, floor. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to introduce Bioscan, the latest research program led by the International Barcode of Life Consortium. The consortium was born in 2010 with its science launch in Canada and its official launch at the CBD meeting in Nagoya that October. IBOL has a 35-year research plan that seeks to register every species, to document their interactions, and to monitor their populations. It's advancing this work by using short gene regions, DNA barcodes, to discriminate species. For example, you only need to sequence a 658 
base pair segment of one mitochondrial gene, CO1, to discriminate most animal species. That's less than a millionth of their genome. While this approach has been in use for nearly 20 years, advances in DNA sequencing technology have now greatly reduced costs and have opened new analytical options. The consortium will achieve its goals through three major research programs. The first, barcode 500K is complete. The second, Bioscan is underway. And the third, Planetary Biodiversity Mission commences in 2027. Before I go further, let me pause and ask you to look carefully at this map to confirm that your nation is involved. If not, please change the situation. Let me look back. Launched in 2010, Barcode 500K had a single goal. Gather DNA barcodes for 500,000 species and do it within five years. There was a simple motivation for this work. It aimed to make it possible for anyone to identify any organism. Barcode 500K met this goal, and it did it by developing a core facility that processed a million specimens a year, and the Bold Informatics platform to host and share the data. Finally, it developed the barcode index number system that automates species discovery. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the BIN system because it's the path that's going to allow us to speed the registration of species. Development of the BIN system was enabled by the observation that members of a species show little barcode variation while there are deep divergences between species. This pattern is shared by diverse animal groups in different environments. For example, this sl slide shows the perfect separation of 27 species of Australian marine fishes. This slide shows a very similar pattern for 50 species of Costa Rican Saturnid moths. Studies on many other groups have revealed the same pattern. This schematic representation shows how easily sequence clusters can be delineated and counted. Work on groups with good taxonomy has shown a strong concordance between these sequence clusters and recognized species boundaries. The BIN system uses an algorithm to ascertain the number of clusters in any set of sequences and that then assigns a unique alphanumeric to each cluster, a barcode index number. This is, in effect, a digital species name. There are now more than 700,000 bins on BOLD. Each one assembles information on the distribution and morphology of a species. In this case, a carabid beetle. When a new sequence arrives at BOLD, it's checked to ascertain if it belongs to a known bin or if it's the founder of a new one. The BIN system effectively automates species discovery and registration. Go anywhere, collect specimens, gather barcode sequences, and let BOLD assign them to BINs, and you have a species count. Although the BIN system represented a major advance to registering all species, there was a barrier. Using the protocols employed by barcode 500K, it would cost billions of dollars to register all species. Because it was critical to seek ways to reduce analytical costs, the IBOL consortium spent three years developing new protocols. It's important to emphasize that there are now two analytical paths. DNA barcoding involves the analysis of single specimens, while metabarcoding characterizes the species composition of bulk samples. DNA barcoding is the better approach because it provides a direct connection between each specimen 
and its sequence. This makes it possible to expand the reference library, to identify specimens, to discover new species, and to ascertain species abundance and occurrence. By contrast, metabarcoding only provides information on species occurrence. However, DNA barcoding is much more expensive than metabarcoding on a per specimen basis. Because both approaches are required, efforts are underway to make it possible to barcode a specimen for one dollar and to ascertain the species composition of a bulk sample for a penny per specimen. A few years ago, it would have been impossible to meet these targets, but they're now within reach because of new sequencing platforms. Modern sequencers fall into two main categories, short read and long read. The short read platforms are ideal for metabarcoding, the long read for barcoding. Long read sequencers have lowered barcode costs because they can analyze many thousands of specimens at a time. Our standard protocol analyzes more than 36,000 specimens in a run. DNA is extracted from each individual specimen and each extract is PCR amplified separately with, a different, with different tags on the primers to allow each sequence to be assigned to its source specimen. Using this approach, SQL2 can gather barcode sequences from 20 million specimens in a year, while lowering the cost to a dollar. Metabarcoding involves the extraction of DNA from a bulk collection with subsequent PCR on the resulting DNA extract. Before sequencing, you can pool multiple samples by using a different pair of PCR primers for the DNA extract from each bulk collection. Using this approach, the NovaSeq platform can run more than 60,000 samples in a year. Current costs are about $50 a sample, or five cents a specimen, if there are a thousand specimens in an average sample. With these protocols in place, Bioscan was launched in 2019. It has three goals. To advance species discovery, to document species interactions, and to track species dynamics. Its work on species discovery will involve the analysis of at least 10 million specimens. Its studies on species interactions will examine a million specimens and will detail their associated parasites, parasitoids, and mutualists. Finally, the work on species dynamics will examine the species present at thousands of sites. Much of the species discovery work will involve a shallow skim, the barcode analysis of 10,000 specimens from a site. However, millions of specimens will be analyzed from Europe, from Costa Rica, and from the Arctic. Dan will provide details on the Costa Rican studies in a few minutes. The work on species interactions will use DNA to reveal hidden linkages. This will approach will take single specimens such as this caterpillar and amplify seven different gene regions to reveal the organisms associated with it, its food plants, its parasites, its predators, its mutualists. This slide shows divergent sequences derived from five flies. In each case, one sequence matched the fly, but the others revealed blood meals parasites, or endosymbionts. For example, a biting midge from West Africa carried DNA from an elephant. Bioscan's final line of work will track species distribution at sites around the world using both barcoding and metabarcoding. 
One recent study examined South Africa's largest national park, the Kruger. Over 12 months, park rangers collected a million specimens at 25 sites across its two ecoregions. Barcode analysis of 200,000 specimens revealed 20,000 bins and 80% were new to bold. The bin assemblages corresponded well with ecoregion boundaries. Consider a future where we'll have similar coverage for every national park. In just six years, Bioscan will have achieved these major goals and, will have lay, and it will have laid the foundation for the Planetary Biodiversity Mission. There are no scientific barriers to the PBM. The sequencing infrastructure is available, as well as the computational platforms. And a vibrant research community is keen to participate. The PBM will revolutionize biodiversity science. We'll know all species of multicellular life. And will have stored their DNA to create a global library of life will have detailed their interactions, revealing Darwin's tangled bank. Finally, we will have activated a global biosurveillance system that will enable humanity to watch over the species that share our planet. In closing, I want to express my particular gratitude to Junko for her efforts to advance the uptake of DNA barcoding through the Global Taxonomy Initiative. I also want to thank the many sponsors of our work, particularly the Japan Biodiversity Fund. Its support allowed researchers from many GTI nations to gain a much deeper understanding of DNA barcoding. Thank you. Our living planet, a library of life. Every species like a book, holding the information for humanity's greatest innovations new medicines, technologies, and economic development. But we are burning those books before we've even read them. We want to know all life, every species. We are the International Barcode of Life Consortium, and we are illuminating biodiversity through DNA-based analysis. By using automation and rapidly evolving DNA sequencing technology, we are bringing this vision to life. Our new scientific program, Bioscan, is shedding light on unknown species, tracking their distribution, abundance, and interactions. Bioscan will bring us closer to building a complete library of life, forming the basis for an Earth observation system. Together, we must act we are not just scientists. We are rangers in national parks collecting the data required to monitor ecosystems. We are indigenous peoples protecting our lands and traditions for future generations. We are citizens supporting science and conservation in our country. This is Bioscan, collecting, mapping, and revealing life's diversity, our species, acting to protect all species before we lose the possibility of even knowing them. Yeah, thank you very much to Paul Hebert and, and all colleagues involved for this um, amazing uh, presentation and certainly sharing a great uh, vision on uh, yeah a yet uh, another upscale of of um, sequencing technologies under the bioscan umbrella and then we would continue and are a little bit ahead of, of the initial uh, time schedule with our third um, keynote speaker for the symposium and this is um, Dr. Thomas von Rintelen uh, from our my own institute. Uh, Thomas is heading our newly uh, established Center for Integrated Biodiversity Discovery. 
and uh, he is a zoologist uh, by training, uh, working primarily with um, mollusks and um, uh, crustaceans. Um, Thomas and uh, his co-authors will uh, talk to you about uh, their experiences on research and collection-based taxonomy capacity building in Southeast Asia, lessons drawn and future perspectives. Um, I would like to give the microphone to Thomas now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and hello to everyone, wherever you may be. Um, yeah, sorry for this little technical mix-up. Anyhow, let's get started right away. So, as um, all of you will be aware, I guess, uh, Southeast Asia is a fantastically diverse, biodiverse region. Of course, it's not uh, alone in this respect, as are all the other tropical regions of the world, and they all share one another characteristic which is that little is known about this diversity when it comes to really diverse groups. So there's one estimate that we know about 20% of species on Earth, if you assume a conservative estimate of 10 million species on Earth roughly. And so there's a lot of work to be done, and especially for the regions that are really biodiverse. Um, it is needed to um, actually record and understand this biodiversity in order to allow sustainable utilization, sustainable development, and um, in order to record and assess this biodiversity, of course, there needs to be progress in modern biodiversity science, so that um, biodiversity can be used as a resource. However, as we also all know, there is both a short and shortage of expertise in uh, taxonomy in the widest sense of biodiversity science, and also in the infrastructure available to apply some of the modern technologies available to us right now uh, is also nicely shown in Paul's talk uh, just before this one. So um, certainly some training and capacity building is required and Museum für Naturkunde has been running projects in Southeast Asia for about two decades but I will focus on projects, larger projects we conducted during the last five years in the region and we did quite a few but I will focus on three major ones Endobiosis in Indonesia, bio in Vietnam, and biofill in the Philippines and Cambodia. And I will briefly run you through these projects with their characteristics and describe what we think we have learned from them and what we would recommend for future projects. Um, before I start to go into the projects, just to show you where these stand in terms of the components. So if we consider that projects might either be pure research, pure training, or may have a strong focus on infrastructure, the Indonesian project in the biosis was very much a research project, not seeking to provide too much training nor invest in infrastructure. So training was provided kind of an afterthought. But um, the other two projects had a very strong commitment to capacity building or have a very strong commitment to capacity building and um, also for the Vietnam project, um, a strong dedication to build infrastructure. With this in mind, let's start with the project in Indonesia that we conducted, which, as I said, was mostly about research and which um, has already been concluded two years ago, together with our Indonesian partners from NIPI. And actually, this project was about um, discovering biodiversity and uh, for health purposes, more specifically for um, finding new bioinfectives from um, no, potentially new organisms, organisms that are new to science and groups that uh, have interesting properties. Um, so that's just the background that of course we were responsible as National History Museum for the biodiversity discovery part. So key component or the key task of our project was to develop a biodiversity discovery workflow with um, providing taxonomic workflow, digital workflow and existing knowledge. I don't want to go into too much detail because there's not much capacity building in here, but just to give you an idea, um, we aimed at the novel integration of standard procedures, um, employing also some new technologies wherever applicable to speed up um, the taxonomic workflow, and of course having a digital workflow to track samples, manage samples, which is relevant for many purposes, not least in the age of Nagoya and the documentation responsibilities we have. Um, and we developed an app which will also shortly be available worldwide. And this allowed us to um, also put data seamlessly into our online information system, 
which in turn can then enable um, citizen science or more interactions with other stakeholders like interested citizens um, that are, can use these biodiversity data, taxonomic data, and also contribute to them in the future. Anyhow, um, of course, we realized, um, well, we did know this before, but it was became clearer during the project that expertise and infrastructure are crucial if such integrated workflows should be rolled out in Southeast Asia and presumably elsewhere. And um, when it comes to expertise, um, there's of course are the classic fields of you know, field methods, taxonomy in itself or taxonomic training, but there are crucial underlying um, skills or expertise in, for example, data management, digital data management, DNA barcoding or other molecular genetic techniques, and of course digitization that are irrespective of the taxon someone might be working on, crucial to bring things together and really streamline the process and make the data available instantly as well. And with this in mind, um, I will now move on to our next project, um, Innovative Approaches to Biodiversity Discovery and Characterization in Vietnam, the Vietbio project. This is still running, actually one year longer uh, than we hoped for, which is sounds like a good thing, but it's actually just COVID induced, so it's not really um, providing any extra benefits. We are running this project with four Vietnamese partners from the Vietnam, Vietnam Academy of Science and Technology. In Berlin, uh, also the Botanical Garden and Museum is involved. And essentially, this is about the development and transfer of an integrated biodiversity discovery monetary system for the country of Vietnam. And from the German side, um, both infrastructure, state of the art equipment like um, DNA laboratory equipment and the training to operate this uh, equipment for biodiversity discovery and biodiversity assessment will be provided, um, leading to the establishment, hopefully, of an integrated biodiversity data and information system in the end. So there are two major types of joint activities. First is field training, um, which has a purpose to provide data and samples for subsequent training in Berlin and also to test um, what I briefly mentioned with the Indonesian project um, and further develop our um, digital um, tools for gathering data already in the field and uh, recording stuff. And then, of course, the training in Berlin at both the Museum für Naturkunde and the Botanical Garden Museum in state-of-the-art methods and for modules and using the equipment that is later to be transferred to Vietnam. And to give you just an impression, well, it looks very much like any larger expedition work. Um, the field training, um, ranging from workshops and classical sampling, but also, of course, crucially involving uh, our digital recording tools. And um, more crucial, the field, the training in Berlin. Um, for the three years, the project is running uh, every year, 12. Um, scientists or technicians from the Vietnamese institutes are visiting Berlin and are being uh, taught um, in four training modules, which are shown here, integrate data management, digitization, DNA barcoding, and bioacoustics. And um, of course, there is more details to each of these uh, modules. I don't want to go into these details, obviously, given the time limitation. Anyhow, um, apart from the specific um, content that is being um, taught or where training is being provided in, um, as a red line, there's the topic of data management, data mobilization, running through all these four modules. So this is really crucial and um, kind of stitching things together as well. And we hope that um, this project will provide mutual benefits for both, of course, the Vietnamese and German partners. And um, the, uh, for the German partners, an obvious benefit success to biodiversity data and samples from Vietnam and generally to gain uh, value of experience. And um, the Vietnamese side obviously um, profits from getting both um, biodiversity research infrastructure and um, know-how on how to um, apply this infrastructure and in the end um, it will help 
those partners to become more equal partners in international research programs, um, which hopefully will expand further in the future. And going now to the last of the three projects um, I would like to briefly report about. This is about biodiversity teaching in a Philippine-Cambodian-German network, Biofil. It's also still running. It's um, in contrast to the other projects, which are funded by the German Federal Ministry for Education and Research. This is sponsored by the German Academic Exchange Service. Um, five partner institutes, four universities, and the National Museum of the Philippines, Natural History Museum. And being a project with university partners, this is very much about teaching. And um, the main aim is to establish biodiversity research, very strong taxonomic component, in Philippine and Cambodian university curricula. And uh, you can see some impressions from the training in the lab, for example, and um, working on specimens. And here the main um, approach is to do a training of trainers. So the idea is to have, as with all the other projects, a sustainable, sustainable impact. So not just conduct a project and afterwards um, leave it as it is and um, hope that things will turn out for the best. But in order to make it sustainable, lecturers and researchers from the participating institutes are being trained so that they can take over the teaching of the five course modules um, of this project which, as it's a university project, is also with has more basic stuff like core scientific skills, but then very much generally the same stuff as uh, being taught in, or being done in the training for the Vietnam project, field methods, methods DNA barcoding, digitization, in addition also GIS and species distribution modeling, and so that's specific, specific components like a student conference and research days in Germany, which make up in some way for the lack of certain infrastructure in the Philippines and Cambodia in particular. So these are the three projects which we would think um, are running rather successfully, or have been run rather successful. However, we have also been drawing some conclusions as to what is really impeding research for Southeast Asian researchers, if we could um, experience um, nicely whilst collaborating with our partners. So if we have four different fields um, which influence research capability, so there's of course bureaucracy, money for research, infrastructure, access and science education. Well, bureaucracy is of course a major obstacle um, and you see a certain ranking um, through the flags or the position of the flags. So the further something is up, the more negative this impact is of the particular in the particular field. However, this is subjective, of course. It's not based on numbers, so it's based on our experience. Um, and there's probably no need to discuss this uh, really in detail whether a country is really at the correct position. But anyhow, we think that the overall picture is correct. So bureaucracy is really for all the countries we work with to a varying degree, hampering research for Southeast Asian researchers. We are not talking now about permits for Westerners and stuff like that, but for the time researchers have to spend to access their own biodiversity, to invest time before they can do research and so on. Research money is another very big obstacle, as is infrastructure, infrastructure access. Actually, sometimes infrastructure looks good, but it is not actually good. So it doesn't help to have sequences. If the consumables are 30% at least or more expensive or maybe two times more expensive than anywhere else, and if there are no technicians who can run the sequences. And science education is probably um, the field which looks best relatively among those four categories. Uh, the Philippines have an advantage simply because they're English speaking. Um, but of course, there's scope for improvement as well. So what do we take home from this? Um, as conclusions for future capacity building in Southeast Asia particularly. Um, there should be more emphasis, in our opinion, on helping to provide access to research infrastructure in the region, which includes also technical staff to operate um, machinery that might be already there or will provide it. Um, we think it also makes sense to try to wait in early, so to target not just the um, PhD students or 
more experienced scientists, but rather university students to help them develop the skills to become competitive to Western students um, during their later career. And bureaucracy first doesn't mean that bureaucracy um, should be at the top of the list of priorities, but rather that it should be considered early on in um, projects to make sure they're viable. Because very often um, projects are conceived by enthusiastic partners and parties and uh, bureaucracy puts the brakes on things later on if it's not considered early on. And we also need to think, and that's probably the main point, where we want to go with our projects. So you can see a triangle, infrastructure projects and access. Um, projects here is also about money to conduct independent projects. So Western researchers currently, they have the infrastructure at their fingertips and they have the money to conduct projects. And Southeast Asian researchers, I'm um, putting it simply now, of course, they have the access to biodiversity. And of course, it's easiest for Western researchers to go to Southeast Asia in this case and participate in the access. It's easier than to move um, money and infrastructure, which cannot be um, also influenced by single projects, um, into the reach of Southeast Asian researchers. But that's exactly where we need to go. We need to get more um, equity in this respect so that we can really co collaborate effectively on um, assessing, describing all this vast amount of um, undescribed biodiversity for monitoring of what, uh, whatever other purposes um, instead of having to focus too much on all these problems I just briefly described. And on this note, I would like to end and thank you, first of all, for listening to the talk. And um, we would also like to thank all our very enthusiastic and highly motivated partners for the fruitful collaborations and uh, to the German government. And um, we should especially mention here the Federal Ministry for Education and Research because they have uh, for a long time supported our research and capacity building activities in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, and um, also to your co-authors and, and team uh, for this um, presentation and for sharing these, um, yeah, much more on ground and, and practical uh, experiences in, in, in doing these um, collaborative, um, yeah, capacity building um, projects. Um, I would imagine uh, on that uh, side uh, there is uh, quite some some opportunity and perhaps uh, immediate reactions and and uh, need uh, to ask some questions. And um, since we have now um, more time than anticipated, um, I would uh, certainly want to offer the floor now but uh, also remind you that we will shortly break uh, for uh, some real break, meaning some 20 minutes, which will then be followed by a, a panel discussion with, uh, yeah, again, the panelists or the, the, the keynote speakers and some, some invited experts. Um, yes, um, Christoph, there is a question from Per Mujik Singh uh, for Thomas. Um, very well presented contribution from the German government to the Southeast Asian biodiversity collections. Was there any scope for repatriation of old collection duplicates back to these areas for further work? Thank you very much, Katie. Um, maybe we can also offer the uh, colleague the floor to expand on his question, but if you could, uh, Thomas, have you uh, been yes. able to follow? Yes, I have. Um, so we have been aiming at repatriation, so to speak. However, this was about virtual repatriation. So starting with the Indonesia project, um, we had quite a bit of emphasis on actually going into our collections and digitizing types in particular, but also other specimens. Um, so that they can become available uh, openly worldwide. So even if the physical specimens are not available um, for Southeast Asian colleagues to study um, at their institutions, they will have high quality images to work with. Um, and we will increasingly do this in Berlin at least um, by also sequencing our collections, focusing also on type specimens 
which of course will provide a very direct link to the information um, embodied in uh, these specimens in a way. Um, potentially, I suppose one could also think about sharing duplicates, but we think that having high quality information um, is probably even a worthier effort as it can instantly be used in research. And actually, this is also what we see from the international community, and not just from um, biodiverse rich region, biodiverse regions. Um, when they ask for our access to our collections, it's not so much physical anymore, but it's about high quality representations of crucial specimens. So we think that's a quite an effective approach. Thank, Thank you. you Thomas. Uh, yeah, Sorry. I, I trust. Yeah, go ahead, Katie. Uh, there's just a, another sort of follow-up question for Thomas. Um, will there be important capacity building in the region in India? And how will they, the GTI initiative be involved there? Can you repeat this, please? How would the Indian plant taxonomist be involved in the GTI initiative in the region? Um, well, India, from my limited experience, um, is uh, difficult in some aspects, uh, not least through very restrictive uh, legislation. But generally, um, if partners approach us, um, we will work with them. That's all I can say at this stage. I mean, it's a very crucial country with um, at a crossroads in terms of, of biogeography. So um, I think there's a lot of eagerness, but uh, it does not seem to be easy always. Thank you. I understand that Thomas Borsch is ready to respond to that. Uh, can you or can we give him the microphone? Mm. I, can you hear me? Yes, we hear yes. you now. Just a very short comment. Um, the uh, there is which i will present tomorrow on behalf of the world for our online council um this is a global initiative but we just uh, have had uh, the botanical survey of india signing the memorandum of understanding in this global effort which deals about um yeah assessing uh, plant diversity and making it uh, available the information synthesizing the information so this was like three weeks ago, and uh, it looks like that there is also something moving on in India. In this case, um, there is the Botanical Survey of India, who is a responsible stakeholder, just as a brief comment. Thank you very much, um, Thomas. Um, there is another question for uh, Thomas von Rintelen now. Is there any partner for your project in Malaysia? Um, actually, um, yes, we have potential partners in Malaysia. Um, but maybe I should point out that, um, first of all, how these projects work. I mean, it's like for practical reasons, which have to do a bit also with funding, it's focused on certain countries. Um, and while our research aims and also the aims for capacity building are covering the entire region, um, it's we are not always free to choose where we where we go in the first place. But generally, yes, we have contacts um, to Malaysian um, institutions and colleagues, and um, are also interested in running projects there. Thank you. Um, unless we have any further direct questions, um, as said, I suggest that we should uh, take our scheduled break now, um, which still leaves us with some more time uh, for further discussion for the rest of the day. Um, but maybe if you allow me to go back to some of the, the, these questions, um, again, as um, was said, these, or the, at least the, the examples um, uh, Thomas von Rintelen presented, are a typical case of these bilateral 
uh, cooperations between uh, partner countries to help um, yeah, implement parts of the GTI. And um, as uh, Germany has its or her priorities in both political and also practical ways, so do have um, many other uh, countries when they look for partners. Um, and also there are certainly different, uh, so to say, preconditions or, or ramifications for these bilateral corporations between the different countries. So uh, it's different in the, even at the European level, for all the European countries, it's quite different how they do that, how they can do that, which are possible partners. And I trust that everybody is generally aware of that, but uh, it still pays off. And I guess this goes back to some of these questions to directly talk to on contact your relevant partner or agencies or counterparts in these countries. Um, there is little the, the GTI or the CBD secretariat uh, trying to, to, to support the GTI can do, but certainly at least from my point of view, we may want to take that up um, uh, when we think about um, what we could do better in the future in terms of trying to, to better provide, and I'm thinking maybe uh, CHM or other mechanisms could help to build these linkages, um, which again are always peculiar to, uh, so to say, the partner countries. So um, even those experiences just shared um, between the projects uh, that the German ministry supported for some of these um, Southeast Asian countries, they probably cannot be generalized too much uh, because when other countries do the same or similar things, um, so to say other rules and other um, um, possible um, priorities will come into play. Still, it is in implementing the GTA, the GTI probably the most um, uh, important uh, support we can get at the moment from national governments going to their preferred partner countries. But again, what we can do from the GTI perspective and again, I would like to, to put this forward for further discussion, is how to at least um, better uh, connect or at least open possibilities for this kind of information exchange and also, so to say, to, to provide a, a market or exchange place where um, parties or countries or institutions with specific needs can find or can try to better line up with um, they are prospective partners. Anyway, if there are no further questions to the talk, um, as said, um, I would now propose that we take our 20 minute uh, pre-scheduled um, uh, break. And let's now, so to say, open the floor to um, questions or contributions to the speakers. Uh, and that's of course in live, there is only Thomas uh, von Rentelen available to respond to you, um, but um, some of us will also try to follow up with uh, questions you may have in um, uh, response or stimulated by the two keynotes. We had the big vision on using uh, next stage, so to say, or new generation sequencing technology to get, yeah, the ultimate job done of getting a total inventory for life on Earth uh, through Bioscan. Um, and we have heard um, a little more um, on the ground practical experiences and also some good um, critical reflections on doing capacity building as a case study with some partner countries in Southeast Asia. So please, um, uh, questions or comments uh, from anybody um, uh, on, the, on the contributions we have heard. Um, I don't see something yet in the question box or from the other participants. Christoph, we have a question from Mohsen. Um, yes, if, Mohsen, if you would prefer to ask your question in person, I can unmute you, unmute you. But his question for the panelists and participants. 
is whether there is such inspection body in your country that monitors the proper implementation of the National Convention on Biological Diversity in both mobilization and execution. Do you believe that this mechanism works for achieving the targets for 2030 and 2050? Christoph, may I respond to that question from the Secretariat? Yes, please do so. Yes, okay. Um, um, it is obvious that um, you know those academics who are um, you know giving the taxonomic capacity development at uh, local level uh, may or may not be connected to the Ministry of the Environment. They are in charge of uh, uh, monitoring the progress of their own country. Uh, that was also the the case uh, since 2010 um, to uh, monitor the you know, national uh, targets, whether that is advanced or not, and report to the secretariat uh, within their national report. So uh, it is very important um, every country uh, have a good cross-sectoral communication between the taxonomic institutions and uh, National Biodiversity Authority. And so uh, um, it is perhaps, you know, um, if it was difficult, uh, Secretariat can intervene to connect you to the national focal point of the CBD. And then uh, the national process is um, dependent on the country's um, policy and uh, setting of the condition for capacity development um, under international program. Therefore, um, I would like to highly recommend uh, for you to uh, search National Focal Point. Their uh, email address and uh, telephone number is accessible from CBD Country Profile page. Um, I will type in the URL in the question box uh, for you to take a look at and so um, the screen shows the uh, global map and you can click your country on that uh, interface and then you can find the um, coordinates of the CBD authority in your country as well as um, there is a GTI national focal point designated by year 2000. Um, if uh, uh, GTI focal point was uh, informed to the Secretariat, that page shows the GTI National Focal Point. I hope this answers um, Patri to your question. Thank you very much, Junko, for that, that uh, certainly helpful uh, explanation. Uh, just to, to repeat again, um, uh, not all, but uh, quite a considerable number of CBD parties of countries have a designated GTI focal point um, and uh, that could or should probably be your first um, point of contact but definitely all countries have a CBD focal point um, which or whom you should get in touch with in case of, of um, any of these um, questions or issues. And again, this all the information and especially the the individuals, their email addresses and sometimes phone numbers can be obtained um, from the CBD website at the at the country profile. Um, I believe we have a request from the floor from um, Mohammed. Uh, Katie, can you please unmute him okay. or? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So my question is to Thomas uh, about the number of uh, taxonomies in Asia. Because I think in, uh, in all the world, this number is uh, declining. Thank you. Well, thanks for your question. Well, actually, I don't have any hard numbers about Southeast Asian taxonomists. But my impression is that the number is certainly not declining. Um, it is at the very least uh, stable as far as um, we can judge from yeah, what we see in our networks and from the uh, conferences we are organizing regularly with Southeast Asian 
biodiversity researchers in general. Um, but the number of taxonomists um, that is available does not necessarily mean that um, this will increase taxonomic output. It's, um, in some cases, it's just um, generation change. In other cases, well, in some cases, people are not employed to really do proper taxonomy. So, but I would at the very least say that the number is, uh, of act active taxonomists is stable. Mind you, that's for the countries we have experience with, so I can't speak for every Southeast Asian country. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Thomas, and also to Mohammed for the question. Um, can I ask Secretariat, Katie, do we have other questions? I don't seem to see further questions at the moment, but again, I'm also still a bit challenged by the system. Yes, we have a question from India. Um, the My point is that science of taxonomy, oh, sorry, it's moving. Science and tax taxonomy is dying at a global level and very few people are interested to pursue this science. Also, the funding opportunities for taxonomic conservation work, especially smaller groups, are usually fewer. How can researchers overcome these issues? Also, what are the collaboration possibilities within this forum available and possible? Thank you very much for that question, which is, um, of course, <laughs> probably for many, many uh, colleagues, highly relevant. I don't know. Um, Thomas, are you willing to take that up? Otherwise, I'm... Well, I can provide my stance on this. Um, actually, um, I think I only partially agree. I, as taxonomists, uh, we are very much used in doom scenarios and also in projecting them. But is it still true? I'm wondering sometimes. I mean, I think it's also it's not a globally uniform picture. But if you just look at the scene here in uh, Germany, at least, I think taxonomy is making a comeback, even though it may not always be what someone who is trained as a classical taxonomist will really like. I mean, it's, the field is broadening, which also means that the individual taxonomists have to do broader tasks. I think my talk has probably also shown that taxonomy, that essentially it's taxonomy. But there are so many skills now involved, um, which are also meant to really cast the outputs of taxonomic work wider and for a wider audience, that um, this is not what people that were trained 50 years ago probably um, would recognize in some ways. So I'm, I'm a bit in doubt whether this doom scenario is really um, the right one. What I would certainly subscribe to though is that the number of taxonomists is still not high enough to really effectively um, do the work that it's needed to be done in, against the background of the biodiversity crisis in particular. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if you allow me, I can add on a little bit, uh, just taking my chair head off for a moment. And um, from my own also partly taxonomic background, I would um, also um, go in the same direction as, as Thomas has done in, in that um, there are certainly quite um, still a number of, of countries and regions where taxonomy is in decline, or at least the number of opportunities or paid jobs for taxonomists is certainly not increasing. And taxonomic capacity overall is, is, is still very limited. However, at least over the past 10 years, I believe we have also witnessed some yeah, almost shiny examples of, of uh, so not only resurrection, but actually thriving communities. I'm thinking, for example, um, in Brazil, we have had a huge program very successfully, which probably now come, came to an end, but or it's not having the same effect as it has uh, some years ago, but certainly a, a number of countries, and again, for me, Brazil stands out, but there are some others who have um, purposefully invested um, in uh, yeah, 
enlarging um, taxonomic capacities and certainly infrastructures. Um, so again, the, the, if you take a global look, it's not, um, uh, or in other words, the GTI has had quite a positive effect, um, not certainly not globally, but in some parts and in some countries. And so we have to take a, a, yeah, a more careful look. Um, and on the other side, of course, I also know, or believe I know a number of, of countries and regions where the situation is still not, not um, very encouraging. Um, and to get back to the uh, probably more um, uh, interesting question of funding, um, of course, in the first place, and again, that's a question we may want to take up in, in a more generic context later, funding is always from national level. So the GTI as a program, as a cross-cutting program under the CBD, and also regional uh, initiatives and societies and, and programs uh, don't have, or usually uh, at least, are not to be looked upon as direct funding sources. So if you or your institution, your partner, are uh, for your own, so to say, for the career in need of support, uh, I believe in most cases, you still need to turn to your national relevant funders, organizations, sources. Um, this may be unfortunate for some of uh, you uh, in countries where these, these possibilities are limited, but certainly the GTI is not, unfortunately, a funding mechanism directly. But however, um, it can and should be used. And again, there are some good examples uh, for um, creating larger scale international support programs uh, in the past, for example, uh, creating in infrastructure capacity in Indonesia, in um, some African countries from either um, the um, uh, some partner countries in the north or in the uh, West, but um, certainly they have, or the GTI and similar programs can help to leverage this funding. Again, they are not, you cannot ask the GTI directly to provide a grant or a support uh, payment for something, but uh, they can and have been uh, used, so to say, to generate or to help convince either your national or other international funders to uh, invest in, in yeah, enlarging or creating taxonomic capacities. Okay, um, that's my addition. I hope that is an adequate response um, to your question. Now, again, I have to check. I believe we have one or two further questions. Again, I failed to read them properly. So, Katie, if you could help me. Yeah, we have another question. Um, so the current COVID-19 pandemic has posed a major challenge regarding meeting the sustainable growth and development goals and actions at the country level as a major field-based research activities were put on hold. Also, there are economic challenges and recessions that are hampering the budgetary provisions for conservation activities. How are these aspects being taken at platforms like the CBD? Thank you. I guess that is or should be, could be a question for the Secretariat. So I don't know if uh, Jonko, you're willing to or Katie to respond to that. Uh. Um, well, th this is certainly beyond of the Global Taxonomy Initiative, and uh, um, there will be a, a Substar uh, online session uh, to be taking into place. Uh, 15th and uh, 16th of December. And uh, the thematic area will be biodiversity and health. So we have uh, prepared a background document as well. And uh, um, primarily targeting to the environmental sector, uh, what is going on and uh, what is the status and what environmental sector can do to prevent future pandemics, in particular those zoonotic origin uh, of the pathogens, uh, not to impact to the uh, the world. So that will be a one uh, information to for us to be able to share. And with regard to the um, you know 
this perhaps might touch on the previous questions. Um, the funding and uh, priority of the area of research uh, falls in certain areas with reasons. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, everybody has to uh, do a little bit of uh, research on what is the purpose of the funding and who will be benefited, whether your research interest or the entire environment will appreciate to your research result. And that kind of uh, um, discussion will be very welcome to consider the future Global Taxonomy Initiative. Um, it is very important. Uh, the basic research has to be maintained and continued, but there are numbers of other players who will be um, impacting on the biodiversity on the ground, and uh, that could be um, perhaps you not know, impacting in the national policy and uh, funding opportunities as well. Um, I, I also uh, learned through the uh, GTI. Um, well, if, if Tim, you, if you don't mind, no, I would like to invite the case of BID uh, that was funded for, mostly from European Union through GBIF. Um, that will be a good example where that opportunity exists for um, all of us to um, move up um, to the better global taxonomy initiative. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you, Junko, uh, it, and thank you for the opportunity to intervene on this on this point. Um, I, th I think that it's important to um, recognise and to emphasise that while the the bilateral funding opportunities that Christoph and others have been highlighting are of course extremely important and that's where the the source of a lot of the funds are there have been some uh successful projects or programs that uh that gbif has been helping to um coordinate that bring together funds so you mentioned the biodiversity information for development program which is through funding from uh Europe aid from the international cooperation arm of the European Commission, and there's another similar one uh, for. Um, and sorry, that covers uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the um, Caribbean, and Pacific um, countries. And there is a similar program uh, funded from the Ministry of Environment in Japan that covers um, the um, Asia region, where it has been possible. It's not very large sums of money. Uh, to be able to develop um, regional-based programs, specifically in this case on the question of mobilizing data uh, largely from uh, collections, but from um, other biodiversity information sources as well. And that has been able to um, support um, uh, institution level and national level and regional level projects um, to help open up significant um, uh, data from taxonomic um, collections. And I think one of the messages, and maybe you know, thinking about where the GTI can really help, um, is that it's really important for those sources of funds that we know are, are available through various bilateral sources can be coordinated into combined programs so that um, rather than always working one one country to country on an individual level, there can be a lot of leverage and efficiencies in inviting participation from institutions across a region and then have uh, pooled capacity programs and training programs on a train the trainer basis. Um, and that in the limited area, um, specifically around the digitization of, of, of collections and the skills in applying data in decision making can actually make those limited funds uh, go further. And I think looking, looking ahead, it will be really important for us as a broader community to be sharing and pooling uh, information about what funds are available from bilateral sources, what are the target countries and regions 
uh, that uh, that flow with that funding so that we can cooperate and collaborate around combined training and capacity opportunities rather than always just leaving it to individual countries to make those bilateral connections. Yeah, thank you very much to Secretariat and to GBIF, to, to Junko and Tim for, for uh, your response and this helpful information. I can see we have another question uh, from Dr. Arun. What are the future possibilities for the collaborators from other regions? What are the criteria of selecting global partners by your agency? Uh, I'm not entirely sure to what uh, to whom this, this question is directed, but uh, if you allow me, I will take a first um, go and then uh, pass the question on. Um, again, as, as um, said, for the bilateral between country to country uh, collaboration, this is um, really dependent on the respective partner country. Each country, not only in Europe, uh, also uh, in North America and also on the Southern Hemisphere, they have their um, specific uh, priorities, criteria, uh, sometimes even guidelines for engaging in collaboration and also, of course, for providing support or funding for these, these programs. And it's very hard to, to uh, generalize, um, so I can, the most I can offer is, so to say, a limited German perspective, which is not helpful to many other countries or uh, regions. So again, depending from, so to say, where you are, um, the best um, overall, um, uh, that uh, very generic uh, experience that can be said, so to say, try those uh, to, to follow up with those contacts um, you have. And on the other hand, feel free to, to approach other interested partners. But again, be prepared to respond to, to their uh, priorities and needs, which may be or which certainly will be different uh, depending if you talk to, I don't know, the German Development Agency or the um, what our um, colleague from our ministry said, the Climate Fund uh, to um, yeah, the Japanese Biodiversity Fund. Again, this is probably not immediately helpful, but um, as um, uh, Tim uh, has uh, just, just pointed to, there are, and I believe we can say a little bit even increasingly, also international funding schemes available now, which GTI can partly uh, praise itself for helping uh, to have generated, uh, like through GBIV, um, also certainly uh, through some of the um, other international organizations and, and bodies, um, I don't know, um, IUCN and others. But again, they, they, they also have their own um, um, priorities, uh, which usually come with some political um, considerations, at least in the back. Uh, Again, I'm not sure if that's really a, a fair or adequate response to your question, but um, and if you, if the question was also pointing to, we have or we could only present experiences from one region. Again, this is just an example. This is not that neither from the German or from any other side we see a priority for Southeast Asia. It's one example. If you stay with us tomorrow, we will hear um, or we have uh, shortlisted some interventions from other regions. Uh, I can see uh, we have um, the Ana Hernandez from Conabio. She will present about the Mexican experience. We will have colleagues from the Bahamas uh, and I believe also from uh, yeah, China again and uh, also uh, South Africa who will share their experiences and, and um, that uh, those colleagues may, may have to add um, relevant information also to that question. I don't know, um, Thomas, uh, Junko, or uh, Tim, if you have to add on that question. Um, otherwise, Katie, can you help me if we have missed or other requests for the floor? Uh, Yes, we have um, a few questions that I think we can save for tomorrow about Bioscan. Uh, but uh, the speaker, Mr. Taleb from Morocco, I'm not sure if his microphone is working, but he has written a question. How can the taxonomy fight against pandemics? 
And again, Mr. Talib, if your microphone is working, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself. Mohammed, I'm happy to give you the floor, but again, technology may be in the way. Let me see if I can be of assistant here. But you should be able to, to unmute your microphone. If not, I'm happy to put that question okay. to... Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, my question, how can the taxonomy find against the uh, pandemic? What's, uh, that means what's the nexus between uh, uh, pandemic and the taxonomy? Thank you. Yeah, thank you again for the question, uh, which I'm also happy to, to pass on if you allow me to for a quick response. Um, definitely um, taxonomy has or must have a, a, a increasing uh, role in uh, not just for this, but certainly also any um, future infectious diseases that is transmitted via other organisms. So any kind of um, infection that goes via vectors, be they classically, so to say mosquitoes or um, in uh, case of SARS, probably as a reservoir, some, some vertebrates, this is where taxonomic expertise is, is of prime importance in identifying and then reliably connecting, um, so to say, transmission lines, especially where, um, for infections where, so to say, a host uh, change or shift or whatever you call it. I'm not the medical expert to have the proper term, but I trust you understand what I mean, where the, the infectious agents is transmitted from one organism to the other. Um, that's, um, uh, of course, a case where you or everybody urgently needs uh, the taxonomic experts for whatever group of, of vector organism we'd be, be talking to. And from our side, just a second, so to say, response. Um, we, we, we certainly realize that um, as a collection-based institution, again, I'm based at the Natural History Museum, we have lots of collections and we have, um, among many other colleagues from other institutions, also taken that up and already see the need to um, uh, make information available about collections of organism groups which have a high prevalence for acting as vectors or who have proven to have a high reservoir of such viruses. So for example, bats uh, and, and other mammals, these are being increasingly screened now in our collections and uh, primarily cataloged. So that's two examples where taxonomy is so to say, or can 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 do something and should be involved and is, is being involved. I don't know, um, Thomas, Tim, any other responses to that question? Tim, please. Uh, yes, uh, th thank you. Certainly, as far as um, GBIF is concerned, it is a, a current uh, priority uh, to mobilize data uh, on the distribution of species that are involved as vectors, hosts, and reservoirs of disease. We're already uh, seeing just from the science literature that uh, distribution uh, data relating to species is already being accessed from biodiversity databases to support uh, disease risk research. And just a couple, one interesting example, even though it wasn't particularly targeted, that in the program I mentioned funded by uh, the Ministry of Environment in, in Japan. We had a project uh, recently, it was actually based in Malaysia, uh, but based around a network of uh, bat taxonomy experts across Southeast Asia using acoustic records to help to mobilize data uh, on the distribution of different bat species um, with obvious relevance to uh, virus um, uh, reservoir sources. Um, and in fact, in, we, we have a, an upcoming call, another round of funding for this Asia project where we, we will be uh, specifically favoring uh, projects that mobilize data um, relating to uh, vectors, hosts, and reservoirs of zoonotic diseases. So I think it's, it's something which is increasingly being recognized as one of the important values of, of uh, taxonomic um, collections um, and information on species distributions. 
Thank you. Um, can I ask again uh, assistance from the Secretariat for other questions which I may not be able to see or have overlooked? We just have a comment from Anna Casino who, who just mentioned um, that the CTAP, the Consortium on European Taxonomic Facilities, has set up a task force for tackling this issue with taxonomic experts in pandemics. So we will have Michelle with us tomorrow. Um, hopefully we can hear more about that as well. But other than that, we have no further questions. Thank you, Katie, and thank you to, to CETA for that, that uh, important information. Um, if there are no further questions, um, I would be inclined to call it a day a little earlier ahead of the schedule or the pre-scheduled time for the discussion. Um, unless, let me just see if there are any further questions, contributions, uh, which doesn't seem to be the case. Um, I would certainly like to thank you all uh, for actively participating and um, just for attending. Um, before handing back the microphone to the Secretariat for final logistics, um, again tomorrow, um, according to our agenda, we first have um, under agenda item four also a number of interventions pre-scheduled. Uh, several of those will include further experiences uh, and lessons learned from individual uh, countries and participants for the GTI. Um, but um, also we will then uh, tomorrow start uh, with the actual uh, work on the, um, uh, as announced earlier, um, on the um, technical series paper or on the information document which we hope to produce as an outcome, uh, not only from this meeting, but at least as a start. So this as an outlook, again, um, we will uh, start or the meeting tomorrow, uh, the next session will start as the time pre-scheduled. This is two o'clock Central European time. Uh, whatever time zone you're in, uh, you have to, or you can take that but it's the same or it stays as, as announced. We will use the same platform, of course, and I hope by that uh, time we will all be a little bit more familiar with the GoToMeeting. Um, if you have any further problems or questions on the technical side, especially, please get back to the Secretariat uh, or let us know. Um, and otherwise, again, thank you so much also for your patience and, and indulgence with some of the, the uh, limitations we had to, to cope with um, uh, to get us started. Um, but I was really impressed by the, the um, interesting discussion and, and all your contributions. So thanks again for the day. I um, would like to hand back now to the Secretariat for any final announcement before we close. Thank you, Christoph. Um, um, uh, I am very pleased that you know, everybody is on a steep curve, learning curve of this uh, interface and uh, um, active discussions, uh, just the beginning. So um, tomorrow uh, we will open the webinar at 7 a.m., one hour ahead of the official opening time. That is just be, uh, for everyone wishes to test uh the webinar and uh, any technical question uh to the secretariat you no know, you can ask um immediately uh after seven and then uh, the official meeting will start at uh 8 a.m in montreal time uh 2 p.m in central european time and i'm so sorry that um, asia and pacific uh um it will be an sometime evening and uh um i have a big sympathy to i am an asian so i have a big sympathy to asia pacific region but no please continue uh to be tuned and uh um we wish you have a wonderful discussion and tomorrow's topic will be more um closer to um, your work, I believe. Uh, therefore, um, uh, the Secretariat welcome uh, your continuous participation. Thank you very much.
Hey, did you have anything to add? Okay. Okay, then again, thanks to everybody and uh, hope to see you all tomorrow. Um, and uh, meeting is closed for today. Thank you. See you.